Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special G0 event, Gender Equality in the Age of AI. Today's conversation is part of the Global Stage Series, produced in partnership with Microsoft and the United Nations Foundation. I'm Penny Abbey Wardina. My work on the progress of women and girls was initially through the lens of human rights and then development, which of course is closely tied to technology. More recently, I focused on soft power, how we use culture, norms, and nudges to advance our agenda. One trend in history is clear. Whenever information technology advances, even in small ways, women and girls advance. This was true of online education, it has been true of mobile phones, and microfinance in the developing world. And we can say without risk of hyperbole that AI will be the biggest technological advance of all. The issue is not whether the technology will work, it is whether the governance that barely works at all for the internet will work for AI. So what do we do when a problem is bigger than laws, bigger than markets, and bigger than technology? We use soft power over, above, beyond, laws, markets, and tech. I'm joined by a panel of experts and leaders in this area in front of a live studio audience. Jack Simke is the co-founder of Newman Fund, a feminist tech advocacy initiative. Vicki Robinson is general manager of Microsoft's Airband Initiative. Michelle Milford Morse is the UN Foundation's vice president for girls and women's strategy. And Lucia Nicholson Ova is a member of the EU parliament from Slovakia. Welcome to you all. Now, we're going to begin our conversation today by addressing online violence and its impact on women and girls. Ahead of this event, the G0 team conducted a survey of followers across social media channels on some of the themes that we're discussing. Here's the first question. UNESCO asked women and girls if they've experienced online violence. What percentage do you think they said they had? 25%, 38%, 58% or 79%. Now let's see how people responded. The correct answer is 58%. Interestingly, half of the respondents picked 79%. Mm. Now Jack, this has been a large focus of yours. Can you begin by defining online violence for us in this context? Yeah, thanks, Penny. I think I've been working on the issue of online gender-based violence for so long, since 2006, I think was the first paper that I started writing on this. And it's interesting that we're having this conversation at the sidelines of the CSW, mm. because the CSW is the first space where the relationship between technology and gender-based violence was formally articulated in a policy document. I think it was 2013. So it's really like one of the, you know, it's a significant moment and space and site and process for women's rights advocates to try and get recognition for this issue. It really took a while. And for me, I feel that online violence or online gender-based violence, online violence against women, technology facilitated gender-based violence, many names, uh, but for me, there's three specific dimensions. Okay. One is where technology is a site where the violence takes place. Mm. So for example, if you're on Facebook or it's in your phone, so it becomes a site where you are experiencing the violence, threatening messages or other, uh, uh, other kinds of acts and enactments. Second is where technology is being used as a tool. So for example, geolocation technology is being used to surveil you mm. in the situation of intimate partner violence. So where it's really being wielded and weaponized as a tool. And thirdly, I think it also speaks to your point around culture. Mm. It's a place where it creates the condition that normalizes violence against women. It creates a condition that makes mm. gender-based violence thrive. And that is the circulation of norms and narratives that continues to perpetuate and exacerbate and amplify discrimination on the basis of gender and sexuality and all forms of conception. And I think that is the piece that also requires quite a lot of attention. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, now, we have a graphic from the UNESCO report I referenced in the survey question. It indicates a wide range of the violence we are discussing, from defamation to harassment and hate speech. Lucia, like millions of women, especially ones in public life, you've experienced this. Um, firsthand, and I got to hear some of your stories, which are really, really hard to hear. Um, thank you for being here to, to share with us. I want to give the, the floor to you. Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, so I entered politics in 2010 uh, before I was an investigative journalist 
in Slovakia. So when I entered the world of politics, I didn't go there just to look pretty on the screen or be, a, uh, you know, uh, all the understanding behind a male leader on a press conference. I continued to unveil uh, corrupted behaviors of the government in Slovakia, and I was really fighting the bad guys. And because of that, I became quite popular in Slovakia. And the more popular I became, the more hate speech and um, uh, online violence I had to experience, and also discreditation campaigns. In 2017, I was the vice president of Slovak National Assembly, and my political enemies, they launched this huge discreditation campaign about me, uh, saying that I was a prostitute uh, in the past. They falsified a police document, saying that I was uh, a head of gang dealing uh, with children and women for prostitution. Uh, the police stepped in to say that it was a falsified document. Uh, all the you know, authorities stepped in to say that it was hoax, it was a disinformation, but it was all over the country because everybody, the, it had like thousands and thousands of shares. Uh, my youngest child at that time was one year old. So when I was walking with my three kids um, in the streets of uh, Bratislava, the capital city of Slovakia, people would spit on me and call me all kinds of different names. And um, it was a real trauma because, I mean, at some point I wasn't able to, you know, go out of my home because I felt so threatened, so my husband had to deal with uh, everything. And it was so difficult to explain it to my children, you know, especially to my daughter. Um, I pressed charges, of course, but the police said that I'm a public figure, and as a public figure I have to deal with it. Um, and uh, so this was just the discreditation campaign. It was um, paid uh, by an oligarch who was very famous in Slovakia, very powerful. And it was done by a former Secret Service agent. Uh, but throughout these years, since 2010 until now, I keep receiving um, hate speech, a lot of, lot of messages. It's like a, basically a daily cocktail of hate speech. Uh, and this is happening because I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. This is happening because I became very popular. This is happening because I'm a liberal politician. Mm -hmm. It's like double curse, you know, women and liberal. And uh, I can just give you examples. And uh, I'm doing this not, you know, I don't, I don't expect you to feel sorry or, or something like that. But I think that when we are talking about violence against women, it's like very abstract. Yes. You know, yeah. nobody knows yes. what, what it really means, what it is. So I can read you a few examples just from uh, these days, basically, every time I open my messenger, it's there or, or uh, Instagram. So I'm sorry about the language. <clears throat> You're disgusting anti-Slovak whore. Damn you and your whole family. I wish you all die of cancer, you fucking rats. I wish 10 guys would rape you in all holes available in your disgusting body. Lucia, you're not a woman. You're Satan in women's clothes. You're scandal and shame on all women. You are Soros whore. You sold ground up pussy. Die, you crazy cow. You fucking whore, you fucking gypsy, go hang yourself. They refer to me as a gypsy because I have a slightly darker skin. That's another curse of me. Um, Nikolsonova, you fucking can't go run to US and never let me come for you cause you'll get such a slap in the face, but slap that will break you down into atomic structure, the slap that will break you and your cronies down. So this is really just a little bit of taste, you know, of, of the daily cocktail. And I'm not here just to talk about me. Uh, in Slovakia, we have uh, Madam President Chaputova. She's very popular. She's great. She's the light at the end of the tunnel, you know. She is extremely popular, but she's also the most hated woman in Slovakia. 
And despite the fact that she's very popular, she was she's probably the best president we ever had, she decided not to run again because of the hate speech, uh, because of the hate speech towards her and towards her two daughters. And we have a very popular journalist, investigative journalist in Slovakia, who suddenly, you know, stopped uh, as a public figure because of the hate speech. So it's not just about me. It's, it's, it's really happening. Like, uh, these words are real. The people who are writing these words are real. So we can erase them, you know, through algorithms in online, but they will still exist. And I think we should be ready, you know, to meet with these people in the real world. So that's why I decided to you know, open my messenger and read the, the, the messages, uh, however painful it is. But I think we really need to know what is out there because it's, it's a real threat. It is a real threat and it seems to be really targeting women politicians, journalists, celebrities. And from your um, perspective at the UN Foundation, I'm just curious if you could share your vantage point on this sort of targeting of such prominent women. Well, Penny, let me start by saying thank you <laughs> yeah. for sharing that with us. That is a profound act of courage. Um, and what the police said to you, just deal with it, is kind of what we're telling all women everywhere when it comes to violence. Right. Just deal with it. This is a circumstance of your being. The UNESCO poll that you showed, the UNESCO data, is reflected in all kinds of data. Plan International has, do has done that data. That data has been verified over and over and over again that more than half of young women are experiencing some form of abuse and harassment online, mm -hmm. sometimes as young as eight. Most of them have their first experience of that at, at 14 to 16. And I don't think that we are thinking enough about the accumulation of that over time mm -hmm. and the real harm to their mental health. Mm -hmm. And so imagine for a girl today who were saying, you can be anything you want to be, you can be any political leader you want to be, but we're going to continue to compound that, ad that abuse that starts when you were young throughout your career. I don't think that we are really thinking through all of that and it is on purpose. It's absolutely on purpose so that women cannot operate from a place of safety mm -hmm. and rightfully claim their equal power at decision-making tables mm -hmm. and for the benefit of, of all of us. So to put it really plainly from the UN Foundation's point of view, how do we see it? We think it's wrong. We think it's unfair. We think it is um, unconscionable. It's a vast violation of the human rights of half our human family mm -hmm. and it has to stop. It has to stop, and the way we're going to also do it is through policy and regulation. So, Vicky, at the Munich Security Conference in February, 20 tech companies, including Microsoft, signed an accord um, to help protect election integrity in the age of generative AI. Now, we're talking today specifically about women. What do you think the tech sector's role and responsibility is to protect them? I think we bear a huge role and responsibility. So, let me start off by saying that the tech accord is a great first initial step. It's important that you had, you know, 20 of the largest technology companies in the world stand up and say that we commit to do our part to monitor the impact of AI, particularly, particularly uh, generative AI and deep fakes and their impact on elections. That's a huge first step, um, but it's not enough. So. You just, so that's sort of the framing of the tech accord. Now think about this. There will be uh, people going to the polls in more than 65 countries around the world between now and the end of the year. That's astounding to me. I've heard figures from 2 billion to 3 billion people who will be going to the polls and saying, mm -hmm. you know, we have something to say. So that's one data point. Compound that with the fact that now you see generative AI kind of on steroids, right? And it's compounding at a rate that shocks the conscience. And overwhelmingly, the way that that's showing up is in a form of deep fakes. Mm -hmm. Now, another data point onto that is 90% of the people who, of, of women are the recipients or the subject of these deep fakes. 
So it's important, and, and we, we talked about sort of the, the policy environment, in the absence of uniform, strong policy environments, technology companies have a responsibility to step up. So for me, as I think about the issue as a woman and as a mother mm -hmm. um, of a girl online at Microsoft, it's incredibly important. And I see that tech accord mm -hmm. as part of a multi-prong approach in the private sector to say that we need to go after it. Yeah. We're gonna go after it because it's a fundamental right. When your technology is out there and it's mm -hmm. creating a lot of good, but it's also exacerbating the opportunity for a lot of harm, mm -hmm. you have a responsibility to do something about that. Mm -hmm. And so the tech accord is not enough. It's a very important first step, right. but it is important to do that. And you have to kind of, you have to understand that technologies and elections should do more to encourage more participation. Yeah. It shouldn't be mm -hmm. the fact that it goes to limit participation. And when I hear your story, it breaks my heart mm -hmm. because I know that if you don't have women leaders mm -hmm. who are representing our views and perspective in legislative bodies, mm -hmm. we're in for we're in for real we're in for real shock mm -hmm. and problems, and it won't only get exacerbated. It goes from the digital world to the physical world. Mm -hmm. So important first step, but we, there's a lot more that needs to be done. But we think it's our, part of our responsibility to do something about it. That is so important. It is like the first step that. You know, Jack, I wanted to, to close out this section. Um, you know, we see what's happening. We see the first steps of action. But how do we prevent the weaponization of this? Because that, it just feels like that's the strategy there. Let's not have women leaders. Let's scare them out of, yeah. the, out of the space, out of the game. And so how do we fight back, protect from the weaponization? Yeah, I feel like. There's been a lot of conversation around gendered hate speech and really the use of um, disinformation and misinformation campaigns to really attack women public figures, particularly women politicians, mm -hmm. journalists, those who are at the front lines, who's like indigenous activists, for example, also. And it's not accidental. It's absolutely deliberate. It's not accidental that, that, that the attacks are on the basis of gender, on the basis of sexuality, and all of the other axes that actually determines where you stand as you know, a subject in a particular space and time. So yeah. mm. racialization, religion, mm, right. so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and the impact, as we, can, as we already heard from Lucia, yeah. it's real. Like People yes. just step out. Like you, the, 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 the beauty and the promise of digital technologies is the opening up of democratic and civic right. participation space. Right. Right. Yeah. But what is happening right now is the direct closing down of these spaces through deliberate attacks. Yeah. And AI, I feel, it's not only like the weaponization of AI, it's almost like how do we prevent the weaponization of technology as a whole? It's become yes. such a critical yes. infrastructure for everything, yes. right? It, mm -hmm. it really um, interfaces between all aspects of our lives. Yeah. And if we're talking about democratic and civic engagement, then that's especially important for us to think about. So what's happening here? Um, and you spoke about generative AI, and I'm seeing this as an increasingly problematic issue because of the issue of deepfakes and how you can create different kinds of content as part of your um, campaign to discredit or to you know, um, uh, really uh, um, enact your attacks. But underlying that is also the, the AI that is powering the dissemination of polarizing content, that is powering all of social media right now. So I almost think sometimes that gender-based violence is good business. Mm. If I can make mm. you share, retweet, mm. be either in support or mm. in protest, mm. as a social media company who's developing all of the different AI, either way, I win. So what is actually challenging the inherent business model of this entire ecosystem right now that is actually thriving off yeah. the attacks on women's bodies? And that's a serious question. And I'm very, very happy to hear that there is true commitment from yeah. the tech sector to also take this on and go like, you know what, this doesn't stand. Like, we need mm -hmm. to do something about this. We are the ones who are developing technology exactly. and who's also like, you know, quite in some ways having a lot of power to, to see where the vision of this is going. Like, what yeah. can it be used for? So I think the first step then is to make sure that those who are most affected will be the ones who are there determining and deciding the value 
the use, the priority, the safeguard, right. and the imagination of what it's for. Right. And exactly. right now, yeah. the figure is not good. Yeah. <laughs> to say it mildly, <laughs> right? Like, even just on the basis of gender, it's pretty crap. Yeah. So then what more, what else? Um, so I think maybe that's the first step. Yes. Like, you know, yeah. how else can we get those who are most affected at the table of driving and decision making and you know prioritization and conversation yes. at all levels at all, right. know? Level. At all levels right. whether it's yep. dev a policy yes. or even in spaces like this where we're having a conversation yes. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. absolutely and i think well i think you scared me more oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you framed the problem that's perfectly really. no and that's the first step is to frame and understand it so now turning now to another facet of the conversation on technology and gender there is a deep correlation between connectivity and prosperity. The International uh, Telecommunication Union reports that of the estimated 2.6 billion people currently unconnected, the majority are women and girls. So Michelle, I'm gonna throw that one to you. Okay. <laughs> what impact does this have on society? Uh, it is, we're basically deciding our future when yeah. we decide who has access. And I'm so taken by the fact that here, we're at this moment of dramatic technological evolution. It may be for the first time in a long time, we actually don't know what comes next. Why in the world are we perpetrating what is true for women out in the world and on the street now in the digital environment? Like one in three women experience violence in their homes and schools and communities. Why in the world do we have a system where they have to experience that violence now online? So I, I want, I want to, I want the fruition of this idea that we have to be in the right chairs to design something better. Because as I said, when we decide who gets access, we decide who controls the future. If girls and women don't have access, basically they are not going to have full unfettered and equal access to healthcare, education, economic independence, job opportunities. They won't have any of that. And they won't have the connectivity, the convenience, the leisure in the form of games and books that I think that they all have the right to. So we're basically deciding yeah. who gets to control the future if girls and women don't have access. And ITU, it does some really Im impressive and important research in this area. It's also dumb economics. I mean, I think mm -hmm. low and middle income countries are missing out on like a trillion dollars in economic growth mm -hmm. by not connecting more girls and women and like look we we've had decades of dumb economics in favor of gender inequality i mean there's all kinds of ways that we can grow economies if we just prioritize women's equality and we keep not doing it however the argument must be made there are economic gains mm -hmm. to seize if we have girls and women equally um, accessing technology and using technology that um, is fantastic. And Vicky, in the first year of the COVID pandemic, we saw a dramatic reduction of women in the global workforce. Um, it has since rebounded thanks largely to technology and remote work capabilities. How would you describe technology's role in equality? It is the democratizing force. Um, we live in an increasingly digital world. We mm -hmm. saw that with COVID. Um, we did have some gains. I think the number was over closer to 3 billion who were offline. And you saw sort of as initially as we were all at home, some initial gains, but they've been very slight incremental. Um, so in a world where it's digital, if you don't have connectivity, which is table stakes, just yeah. at least having the option to be able to be connected, you can't, meaningful, you can't have meaningful participation in a world. Um, particularly in a world where you have things like AI. Right. So right. what keeps me up at night as I think about, and I spend a lot of nights that I was up at COVID, <laughs> and, but I have four <laughs> or five devices, I have fiber to the home, and so I was mm -hmm. well connected and well ready. I wasn't ready to try to educate my kids while we were at home. <laughs> <laughs> but we could still do healthcare, I could still work, I could still, you know, I, I'm not an entrepreneur, but if I wanted to be one, I could do it if I, if I was online. When people don't have that access and the skills mm -hmm. that are necessary to use it in a meaningful way and in a safe way and productive right. way, because that's important, it's not just about access and connectivity, it's meaningful connectivity, they can't participate in a digital world. Yeah. yeah. And when you have AI kind of in the mix and kind of accelerating this, we're going to widen the gap. Yeah. 
between women and girls and others who are other, who's kind of sitting in the other space to your point. Yeah. And so it's critically important now, more than ever, we need to make sure that we close the digital divide once and for all, right? But that we bring along with that the skills, we make it affordable, we make it accessible. I'm single-sided deaf. Yeah. I need to be able to yeah. have the technology reflect my lived experience so that I can use it in a way that's powerful and relevant for me. So all these things are things that we need to get after. And we could have another COVID shutdown. We don't know what's going to happen. You should kind of expect the unexpected. So that's my long way of saying is that it's just kind of heightened the issue for me. And there's a lot more work to be done. And we actually have a poll <laughs> that goes along with that comment. Um, so here's another poll um, that G0 asked followers. What impact will AI have on gender in mm. inequality? Will it reduce it? Will it increase it? Or I don't know. And I love this response. And here's how people voted. 22% wow. said it would reduce inequality. 27 oh, will increase inequality. <laughs> and good for them, 51% said, I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> um, so Jack and then Lucia, I really would love to have your thoughts on, on this question. Um, you know, and really shifting towards the, the, the impact and the tools. So access is a, it's, it's actually quite a complicated question mm. because it costs a lot of money, yes. especially because access infrastructure is expensive. expensive. It requires a lot of commitment and collaboration between yes. telecommunications company, between governments, between like, you know, it requires collaboration and commitment. And then you have the last mile, so you have the infrastructure and the last mile, and then you have at the end of that, do you have devices? Right. Do you have capacities? Right. Do you have content that even makes sense to you? Exactly. And then on top of that, there's violence. Yeah. So yep. it's like, yeah. oh man, <laughs> so many things. But we are operating in a situation where digital infrastructure is becoming the singular mediating infrastructure for all levels of life, for all layers of life, mm. whether it's economic, political, social, cultural, health, um, and, and like all layers of it. And we saw it especially in stark ways during COVID. Yes. yes. It became yes. the answer to everything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no access to education? No problem. It'll be online. It did not make sense. Nobody learned anything online, <laughs> really. <laughs> Except, you know, how to not pay attention and maybe like have, you know, I don't know, like develop all kinds of issues. I, I said, yeah. Maybe how to bake sourdough bread. Okay. Um, <laughs> but it's it's a real it's a we we still don't know what the impact of that is yeah, to a whole generation right. of young people who had to, and I like to give this example as well of um, of this this um, fifteen year old girl in East Malaysia who had to take her like a major examination online, mm. and she had no connectivity, so she had to climb a tree, oh. put two phones oh, out, oh and God. then she was also, you know, she had a great sense of humor, so she was also YouTubing it. Oh, and show, like, you know, she had to basically camp out that night and like had three power sources and tried to basically just like YouTube the whole thing and trying to take <laughs> this exam. But that's the extent of ridiculousness of the assumption yeah. that we can just solve this problem like this. Mm. The good news is that during COVID, we saw an acceleration and uptick of connectivity like that, that really took a long time to push the needle. Mm. Right. So there was right. a lot more people who got online during that particular right. period and the gender gap closed overall globally. Mm. However, regionally, not the case. Mm. So for example, yeah. in sub, sub saharan Africa, the gap actually extended in terms mm. of yep. gender. So I think that there's something we need to think about here mm. that is, you know, even as we're trying to resolve the, the question of the experiences of violence on the one hand, and the development of new forms of technology and the imagination for it on the other hand, mm. but also the reality and the challenges of meaningful access yes. mm. um, right. underlaying all of it. And it all requires commitment. Absolutely. It requires like uh, <laughs> conversations with people that you maybe generally would not have a conversation with. Mm. But, but, but where do we stand in the... But what can we see that is a shared vision? Mm. Yeah. Like if women and girls do not get online, what happens? Yeah. Next. What happens then? Like right. to all of us. No? Right. I want to invite Lucia to respond to this this question as well. Well, uh, of course, it's very important so that girls and uh, women have the same access uh, to to you know online media, to internet, and uh, techno to technologies. Uh, but 
my main concern is really uh, to make it safe enough for them to enter because uh, there is a lot of violence, there's a lot of nastiness, and they should be ready for this. Now, in the long term, I see education as the you know main thing that could make them ready, the media literacy, also critical thinking and so on, so that they actually are ready what to you know, expect uh, in the online world and uh, also, you know, how to protect themselves. Um, you know, we fought so long to make it possible for women to enter the public life. Mm -hmm. And I feel like now we are losing them, yep. you know, because more and more uh, women in public are just giving up. And this is the main cause is really the, the hate speech at, yeah. and the uh, online online violence. So, so yes, of course, I'd like for all the girls, um, uh, to for them to be um, able to to access, you know, all these, you know, services, all this this big world of technologies. And um, but on the other hand, you know, we really have to make them make them ready. And uh, one thing in in particular, I think that um, you know, women should stick together. And this is not happening. I mean, yeah. let's be honest. Uh, this this is a great gathering. I can see a lot of young women. Uh, we are all on the same line now, you know, holding fingers for each other and, and caring. But this is not very much the truth when on the national level, because we are in constant competition. Mm. So uh, this was my experience and also many, many politicians in Slovakia. When it's happening to, to me, you know, there are not all of the women standing up and uh, holding press conferences and fighting uh, one for each other because of the competition. And it's not only about politics, it's also about uh, the journalism and, and so on. So I think if we all stick together, uh, we would be much more powerful and, um, and being able to combat the, the violence in online space. Absolutely, and that's a good transition to the leadership conversation. So we talked about the dark side of technology and online violence, and we have also described the need for digital inclusion to achieve greater gender uh, equality. Now let's talk about the female leadership um, in STEM industries and beyond. Um, here's a final survey of G0 followers ahead of this event. They were asked, what percentage of STEM workers globally are women? 18%, 29%, 41%, 57%. Here is how they voted. And the correct answer is 29% according to the World Economic Forum. The most popular answer was 18%, by the way. The reality is a little bit better than people suspected. The same is true, though, in other industries, uh, corporate boardrooms, government. Women have, by and large, not attained parity in leadership. So I want to ask all of you this as a closing thought. Um, why is it important that more women gain leadership roles in all facets of society? Vicki, I'd love to start with you. You know, whether it's STEAM or other things, if you are not part of the conversation and part of the design process, part of the decision-making process, you're kind of starting off at a deficit. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about, Jack, about like the importance of having, you know, not just a seat at the table, as you know, a woman or uh, any other, but it's also like if you don't have one, you need to pull it up. Mm. And so if I think about STEAM, you know, I, it starts at a very early age. You have to kind of be able to, because those are the leaders of tomorrow. Right. You have to start early and kind of exposing them into to STEAM, and we do that. You see that in the tech sector through programs like, uh, you know, technology, education, and literacy mm -hmm. in uh, schools, our, our TEALS program, and I love that because people are volunteering mm -hmm. and showing as role models what's possible. Mm -hmm. Because you have to be able to conceive it, to believe it, and if you don't see it in yourself, and that's why what you're saying is so important, if my daughter doesn't see leaders in, pu in the public sphere mm -hmm. representing our interests, why in the world would she think that she can do it? Yeah. Um, so it's important to have those role models. It's also important when you kind of, when you actually are, we are able to bring women into these spaces that we make sure that they stay there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a one and done thing. 
the role to it driving an inclusive workplace is ongoing and everybody bears a role in doing it. It's not just my work. You don't make it the kind of the, only the women's like like blame the victim. No, we all need to have a role in doing that. So it's kind of like making sure it's inclusive while it's there, make sure I can stay. Right. Mm -hmm. equal pay, equal representation. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's multifaceted. And so I think, uh, as I think about leadership, it's like, you know, what do I need to do to kind of create the frame, the role model, so that we get the leaders of tomorrow to yeah. continue to kind of want to show up and step up? Because right now my daughter was like, I have no desire to go into public office, but she has very strong views to having the role models, the tools being exposed, mm -hmm but also when they get there, help them to stay there. For heaven's sake, so many women left the workplace after, think about COVID, right. they're like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm done, and so we have a lot of work to do, but I am optimistic. Good. I am glass half full, and it's, an, it's, it, it's really participating forums like this, and I think about, like, you do have programs that recognize our value, mm -hmm. and in this AI moment, if we're not included in the, the models, the representation, the policy, the regulations, we're gonna be in big trouble. Yeah, absolutely. So now is the time to lean in. Mm -hmm. now, I know everyone's weary, <laughs> but you know, you have to keep going. <laughs> we have to keep going because we have a lot of work to do and we need all of our voices at the table to step up. Absolutely, Lucia? Closing thoughts? Well, it's very important for the next generation of uh, girls and young women, you know, to see the role models, not only in STEM uh, segment, but in all the sectors and in all the, the, the segments, um, uh, so that the women voice is heard. Um, and uh, sometimes, you know, I, I feel sorry when I, when I share my story, uh, because I feel like, uh, you know, maybe, um, you know, for a girls, for girls that want to enter the world of, of politics, I'm not the best example, you know, because mm -hmm. basically after 14 years, I said to myself that uh, I've had enough. But um, I think it's also, I, it's very important to encourage uh, the girls and uh, women, you know, to enter all the segments, not only politics, you know, to be public leaders uh, so that the younger generation have some role models uh, worth following. Uh, but on the other hand, we also have to tell them the truth, you know, exactly. what to expect them yeah. uh, so yeah. that they are not naive because if you're too naive and you enter this world, right. then uh, you will quit very soon. Yeah. And we, we have uh, polls that show us that uh, in politics, it's after the first mandate, basically, that uh, the vast majority of politicians, women politicians, just give up mm. because they cannot bear it. And uh, for this, uh, you know, we really th uh, need to think about how to protect them. And I would say the, the legal framework is very important mm. here. And also the criminal law, we should, we should really uh, say that what it's not um, allowed in the real world shouldn't be allowed in the online world. And this is not the reality right now in these days. A colleague earlier was saying that in certain countries there's a fine of 16 euros. Well, it happened in Slovakia. That was that my, my was I, I couldn't, it's yes, 16 I, euros. I pressed so many charges because of the hate yeah, speech. Whenever I went to the police, they said like, you know, you're here again and uh, we told you we don't have the framework. So basically uh, the biggest punishment for, uh, you know, uh, these uh, authors of the hate speech was 16 euros fee yeah. fine. 16, mm. not 60. Thank you again for sharing your story with us. Jack? In Malaysia, it's 10,000 ringgit. However, it's never used for gendered hate speech. It's used for if you make a criticism against the government. So mm. Mm. you can have the law, but also application. So if the question is about why it's important to have mm -hmm. more women and girls in kind of leadership spaces, mm -hmm. I think like if I ask generally, how do you feel your relationship to digital technology is? Like, what's your feeling? Does it fill you with 
joy, mm. happiness, mm. excitement, <laughs> power, power, or does it make you go like, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> I have to day. use this, I have no choice, no, <laughs> but, and, and I think it's not accidental, we, it's because we are really suffering from a crisis of imagination mm. when it comes to the development the utilization and the vision of what digital technology is meant to be in our lives. Mm. And we are constantly running with this crisis of imagination mm. and trying to ban aid all of the problems mm -hmm. because it is really being directed and led and imagined and shaped by a very small group right. mm -hmm. of people mm. who share very similar mm -hmm. ex life experiences that was an embodiment. Very, very diplomatic way of putting it. Yes, that. I was going to say it. five white men in the city, but you know, <laughs> like, yeah. So then I stopped myself. Yeah. But it really is a crisis of imagination. How can this be actually shaping and driving an infrastructure that we are using globally mm. for everything in all of our diversity? It is a singular cause of a lot of the crisis that we are facing right now that technology has a direct link to. Yeah. So if we do not have more people participating in the shaping and making of this in ways that is really dis decisive, mm. then we will always be playing catch up and buying band aid. Yeah. And that is the single reason why it's absolutely important. And it's not about individuals. Yeah. It's about collective power. That's right. mm -hmm. It's really about making spaces for much more heterogeneous, diverse yes. forms mm -hmm. of collective power so that those of us who are most affected will go, actually, I want my relationship to technology to be a little bit more pleasurable. Please, yes. thank you very much. So let's see how that could be like, right? <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. Michelle, I want to give you the last word. I first want to say to women who are leaving the workforce and women who are leaving politics that you're doing so is not unlike a person leaving a burning building. Mm. There are reasons mm. why you did that. And we, we see you. <laughs> and it, this is a systemic failure. The, we brought up COVID. In January of 2020, so before we were all locked at home, mm. there were fewer women in the global and U.S. workforce that January than there were in 1995 mm. oh. when women showed up in Beijing at the Fourth World Conference on Women. So that is a result of decades of a pay gap that won't budge, a, a care gap that hasn't changed, yes. mm. and the fact that women are not represented in leadership in legislatures, parliaments, or in companies. I think we have a new record of women who are CEOs of the Fortune 500. I think we've gotten to 10%. I heard 10.4. Yeah. Somewhere around yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, yay. And it was, <laughs> it was 0% in 1995. That is very slow progress yeah. Indeed. Mm, over a, a, long, uh, a long time. And I'm so pleased you brought up the, this question, too, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's really important that all of us recognize the narrow, cynical attacks on that is mm. all political theater. Mm. Excellence and merit are not mutually exclusive from diversity. And we have to reject the narrow political attacks on that. Mm. And we have to say the companies that are really smart about this, the companies that are smart about this, they're going to have better supply chains. They're going to have better chance recruiting talent. Mm -hmm. They're going to have, um, they're going to win market share. They're going to have better products. They're going to have better profit. We have all kinds of data that shows that. Yep. Parliaments and legislators that have more women, they prioritize social services mm -hmm. for children and the most vulnerable. When they engage in peace agreements, those peace agreements last longer. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to protect biodiversity. They're more likely to negotiate longer. <coughs> We have all the data there too. Yeah. So the frustration you hear from me is like, why does everyone keep asking me why we need women leaders? <laughs> mm -hmm. The question I have is, yeah. why, why don't we? we? There is no argument for half our human family yeah. to be shut out of society such that they don't get to make decisions about all the things that affect us. That's the question I have uh, in response to that question. So that's love fantastic. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so that concludes our program. A huge thank you to our panelists. Um, and to learn more about the Global Stage series, head to g0media.com slash global stage. You'll find interviews, live streams, and podcasts that tackle issues at the intersection of technology, politics, and society, like the ones we just discussed. I am Penny Abby Wardina. Thanks to our studio audience here in New York. And to all of you watching online, have a great day.